Okay, let's pick back up on this book, Synthetic Intelligence and the Transmutation of Humankind, A Roadmap to the Singularity and Beyond. We are in Chapter 10, uh, AI, I Am Lucifer's Vessel, and we're down to the section titled Robo Doctors and Virtual Reality Vacations on the Horizon. Am I joking? Robo Doctors? No. I'm not joking at all, although I wish I was. In an article originally from Forbes.com, uh, it says that robot doctors, virtual reality vacations, and smart toothbrushes are just the tip of the iceberg of what we can expect in the near, very near future. Again, this is not a conspiracy theory. It comes directly from the horse's mouth, namely Stanley and Duke researcher and lecturer Vivek Wadwa. He was holding a lecture at the billionaire Jeff Green's Closing the Gap conference in front of 300 people. He was addressing the gap between the rich and the poor, emphasizing that everything is changing at an incredible speed in these nanotechnological times. Quote, the future is going to be happening much, much faster than anyone ever imagined, said Wawa, explaining that tech growth has been exponential meaning as techn technology advances, it does so with increasing speed. Ray Kurzweil couldn't agree more. It took more than a century to go from Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone to Gordon Gecko's iconic clunker in the movie Wall Street. Just two decades later, we have the first iPhone. In t 2010, $1,000 would buy a computer with the computational power of a mouse brain. Soon it will buy you a computer as strong as the human brain. In about seven or eight years, the iPhone 12 will have the same computing power that you do, said Wawa. Unquote. Those who don't want any part of being hooked up to a super brain computer are going to find themselves in quite a sterile and personal world in a few decades or less. What is probably going to happen is that like-minded people will join together to build their own world apart from the post-humans, who will sink deeper and deeper into the virtual reality world of AI. There does not seem to be any alternative. Humanity will be separated into two factions, those who follow the AI version and become post-human, and those who cho choose to become sovereign human beings. Regardless which path we're choosing, these are the end days of humanity as we know it. Those who choose the AI version will become cyborgs, and those who choose the more spiritual path will become a new species as well, much more psychic, reuniting with nature. In the West Penray papers and my ebook Beyond 2012, I argued that by creating our own local universe from inside, we would be able to build new communities that are still consisting of genuine homo sapiens sapiens, and by concentrating on the reality we want, we will eventually have created an earth that is quite different from the one the singularity is now creating. The two would literally be worlds apart. However, there are two obstacles on this path. The first is reproduction. Homo nova will still remain mortal and needs to reproduce with sex, as we've done for eons. The problem is that this might not be possible because of nanobots and other reproduction inhibitors that the controllers have subjected us to. Having offspring will become more and more difficult. The second obstacle is that although it is possible to create another probability that does not include AI, being stuck here in 3D makes it quite a challenge to break loose, return to the KHAA, and I'm not sure what that stands for, and from there create a new reality. Again, it's not impossible, but the challenge is almost unachievable. When I wrote my previous works, I was more positive about creating a reality in which we can live in harmony and even nano travel. However, back then I didn't realize all the implications of AI and the singularity and the momentum it was gaining. Although I'm not as enthusiastic about this option now as I was back then, I still don't want to discourage those who want to try. 
but those who choose this path have to be careful. Fortunately, there is a third option that we are going to discuss in the later part of this book. This option requires determination and the ability not to give into fear and to get trapped in illusions, but if done correctly, it will lead out of the trap. Our brains converted into binary code. By the end of 2014 or at the beginning of 2015, scientists announced that they had done the first monkey head transplant. Before that announcement had even had time to settle in people's minds, a new announcement was made. The U.S. military's Blue Sky R&D agency, DARPA, announced their plan to create a particular chip that will be implanted in people's brain. This new technology would make it possible to be able to communicate directly with computers. On its website, DARPA explains the following about this chip. Quote, the interface would serve as a translator, converting between the electrochemical language used by neurons in the brain and the ones and zeros that constitute the language of information technology. The goal is to achieve this communications link in a biocompatible device no larger than one cubic centimeter in size, roughly the volume of two nickels stacked back to back." Unquote. What DARPA is telling us has certain very disturbing underlying consequences. Because you have read this far into the book, you know part of the agenda behind AI and the singularity, and most of us know that computers work on binary codes, ones and zeros. DARPA is basically saying that we are now heading toward a future in which our brains are thinking in ones and zeros. Thus, we're only going to be able to think in direct opposites. There will no longer be any gray zones, such as there aren't any gray zones in a computer's thinking. Something either is or it isn't. No negotiations are possible. The people on top of the alien invader force pyramid are working hard at making us feel comfortable thinking in terms of ones and zeros, i.e. they want us to computerize our thinking. Wait a little longer and DARPA, or some other military agency, will probably announce that if we accept our, their brain chip, they promise we will achieve an incredible boost in intelligence and the opportunity of becoming immortal. In the West Penray papers, I inform the readers that the alien invader force has kept us in the dark about what happens after we die. This mystery creates a fear of dying. The fear of death will make many people desperately cling to eternal physical life at any and all cost. Most people will accept the chips that are provided by the military if they are guaranteed an end to physical death. This is how they have planned it. Now keep the above in mind as we continue. DARPA keeps seducing us with the following. Quote, Today's best brain computer interface systems are like two supercomputers super trying to talk to each other using an old 300 baud modem, said Philip Alvalda, the NS NESD program manager. Imagine what will become possible when we upgrade our tools to really open the channel between the human brain and modern electronics. The NESD program aims to develop systems that can communicate clearly and individually with any of up to one million neurons in a given region of the brain." Unquote. One doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to see what potentials something like this will have in the hands of the military. Total control over our thoughts and what we are allowed to think. Imagine a world where protest against the regime is impossible because if someone hypothetically would oppose an idea put out by the military industrial complex, certain neurons in that person's brain would be adjusted and the opposition would be eliminated. This person still has eternal life, but what kind of life? Readers of the West Penray papers who might have thought in the back of their minds that humans would not blindly become cannon fodder for the alien invader force in space wars and eventually in a dev devastating war against our creatrix in Orion, now must rethink that conclusion based on this DARPA information. 
The military industrial complex may promise eternal life, but only if you're not destroyed in space wars, something they will not even bring up because, as Dr. Kurzweil says, there probably are no aliens. However, as Dr. Kurzweil further says, repeatedly in books, lectures, and interviews, there are dangers with AI as well, but I am an optimist. I believe in a positive outcome. In other words, he is telling us to stick our heads in the sand, hope for the best, think about all the positive outcomes of AI and the singularity, and the glaring dangers will just go away. It's obvious how they manipulative they are at marketing all of this, but it's only obvious to those who care to figure things out. The rest of humanity is not going to make it. I am sorry. All football fanatics, TV watchers, idol worshippers, and smartphone addicts, you are signing your own death certificate as souls with a free thinking mind. You are now already at this moment quickly tuning into AI. You are destroying your own species and you are responsible for it. This may sound harsh and judgmental, but it's not to be meant to be either. It's just solid facts. Of course, we can always rely on our president to take care of it and help us out of this jam. After all, that's what he was elected for, to think for us. Therefore, what is our president's standpoint? DARPA explains it to us, and I'm, <laughs> this is Obama, not our president now, but, quote, DARPA anticipates investing up to $60 million in the NESD program over four years. NESD is part of a broader portfolio of programs within DARPA that supports Bre President Obama's brain initiative. For more information about DARPA's work in that domain, please visit blah blah blah. Unquote. What a surprise. Obama is in on this. Does the reader think that if Hillary Clinton or, God help us, Donald the Trumpet Trump will become our next president, either of them will oppose the singularity? Of course you don't. The Gizmodo.com website comments on the DARPA article we've just discussed by writing. Quote, so DARPA wants to turn neural language into digital code, potentially opening up scenarios wherein the human brain can mainline data, data and people can talk to machines simply by thinking, like having the internet inside your head, which would not be overwhelming at all, unquote. This is a good perspective, but what the article misses is that not only will we have the internet in our head when the military industrial complex is done with us, we will have a billion times more information in our heads, but it will not even be overwhelming. We are currently using 3 to 7 percent of our brain capacity, which quite well corresponds with how much of our DNA is activated. But again, when the military industrial complex and the alien invader force have completed the singularity goal, our brain capacity will be 100% or next to it. However, this astonishing capacity will also be 100% controlled, so the gain for us is virtually nothing. Even more important is the following. What will make humans so powerful if our full capacities are opened up is that we also have this wide range of emotions that most other ETs lack. Does the reader think that the alien invader force wants to let those emotions free? They won't. Instead, they want to subdue most of our emotions, except perhaps anger and rage, which they probably want to be able to trigger in us whenever needed in combat. This would make us a deadly weapon. When we became part of the singularity, or when we become part of the singularity, it will take care of erasing our emotions, of course. We will only be able to think in ones and zeros, black and white. Now we can see why Lord Inky and his alien invader force only deactivated most of the human brain computer instead of totally destroying it. They would need it later, and later is now in the 21st century. The Palladians, who are pro-Inky, have been talking about Inky's gift in their le lectures recently. And they claim that Inky, when he genetically manipulated Homo sapiens sapiens into their current state, hid a back door in the DNA which will be activated in humankind 
when we are conscious and aware enough to be able to take advantage of the implications of this gift. They further claim that when the time is right, we will be activated through this back door. I believe them. However, they want us to believe that this is a benevolent gift that will take humanity to a new level of awareness. But to me, it sounds as if this back door will activate the dormant DNA, the so-called junk DNA, once we are ready for the singularity. The following might be something to ponder. What if Inky, with his team of Orion scientists, have helped enhance our awareness gradually in conjunction with the cosmic energies coming our way so that the alien invader force can make sure humanity is on a certain level of awareness before the singularity is in place so that a majority of us are ready for the intelligence boost that is the result of the singularity. This makes much more sense than Inky's gift being something beneficial to humankind. Dr. Kurzweil in his book promises us that in a future world of the singularity, cancer and other serious diseases will be obsolete. If any bodily disease at all would develop, the cure would be nanobots. This, these which would be directed toward the place of the ailment, and these nanobots would only destroy the cells that are sick and leave the healthy ones intact. This is exactly what scientists are claiming they will be able to do soon. They already can. As I mentioned earlier, the nanobots, in cooperation with other things, work as miniature antennas, and in this case they will receive directions from outside where they should go in order to cure the illness. Now you understand one of the reasons why those in power have suppressed any natural cures of cancer that have been developed in the last one and a half centuries. If a natural cure would have been allowed to be released, the entire AI project would be in jeopardy. This is the reason why geniuses such as Dr. Royal Rife had his cancer research destroyed and he himself was silenced. Who then were the for forces at the forefront to silence such a genius as Dr. Rife? Of course it was the American Medical Association. Also while we are on the subject of the AMA they called Samuel Hanneman the father of homeopathy, a crazy man and his research outright dangerous. Still, the royal families all over the world are using homeopathy as part of treating their own ailments. The following is from homeopathic.com. Quote, Besides keeping homeopaths out of their societies, the AMA wanted to discourage any type of association with homeopaths. In 1855, the AMA established a code of ethics which asserted that orthodox physicians would lose their membership in the AMA if they even consulted with a homeopath or, either, or any other non-regular practitioner. At the time, if a physician lost his membership in the local medical society, it meant that in some states he no longer had a license to practice medicine. Often, orthodox physicians who controlled the medical societies wouldn't admit homeopathic physicians and then would arrange for their arrest for practicing medicine without a license. Ultimately, homeopaths set up their own local societies and established their own medical boards. The AMA and its members did everything possible to thwart the education of homeopaths. In the early 1840s and again in 1855, Advocates of homeopathy convinced the Michigan legislature to establish a professorship of homeopathy in the Department of Medicine at the University of Michigan. The AMA resolved to deny recognition to the university's regular med medical graduates if a homeopath, as one of their professors, signed their diploma. At the time, all professors signed graduates' diplomas. The homeopaths brought their case to the Michigan Supreme Court three times, but each time the court expressed uncertainty as to its power to compel the regents of the university to take action. Tirelessly striving toward superintelligence. We have all heard of when the police arrest, some, arrest somebody who is drunk and has assaulted somebody else. 
Where I work, I see people coming into the emergency room all the time after being assaulted. It become, it's become too common for people to think much about it. However, now we need to get used to people being arrested for assaulting robots too. Inde Independent.co.uk reported in September 2015 how a 60-year-old drunken man in Japan assaulted a robot by kicking it when it read the man's emotions. In reality, the man was getting angry at a staff member at the bank, but lashed out at the bank robot instead, which could read emotions, such as anger, joy, and irritation. The man was arrested for de destroying somebody else's property. The Independent further noted, reported that this particular robot can tell jokes, read your facial expressions, and voice tone and dance to entertain the customers. This may sound curious and a bit odd, but this is just one of the first steps in a series of steps that will lead to robots achieving superintelligence and legal standing in society. What I found interesting as a sideline to the story is that SoftBank, the company, company that designs the kind of robots the drunk man attacked, is called Aldebaran, and those readers who recall what I wrote in the West Penray papers, perhaps, also recall that Aldebaran, a star system in the constellation of Taurus, the bull, is one of the major outposts for Lord Inki, the king of the gods. The movement does everything in its power to make us adjust to the new virtual reality, even in fashion design. The new trend that the textile industry is manipulating people to like is wearing technology as part of a new clothes design, making the person look more robot-like and futuristic. In Figure 4, we see an example showing the chip that will make the clothes blink and glimmer. More can be explored at a website that's in the footnotes. Will people actually wear these kind of clothes? Maybe not the most extreme designs, but looking at history, young people will probably take some of it to heart. In August of 2015, Sputnik News announced that AI machines now match the IQ of four-year-olds. Obviously, the controllers are progressing faster and faster now, as we are closing in on the singularity. If we keep August 2015 as a benchmark, we will be able to see how long it takes before they release what they already have. Fully functional AI robots that act and look just like humans, and few would be able to tell any difference. When we say that AI robots are as intelligent as four-year-olds, we distinguish between young AI and robots who can, for example, outsmart humans in algebra and chess. In the first case, we are talking about robots that also act like humans in their physical behavior, which is not the case yet with the chess-playing robots. Most of us already are already used to metallic robots that can be programmed to walk mechanically and lift product, products off of a table and go and put them elsewhere, but that's not really intelligence, it's programming. Intelligence, however, starts developing when a robot can teach itself to do things without being specifically programmed from someone or something inside or outside. Self-educating robots already exist and are now being introduced to the public. One example is a robot that is teaching itself to walk like a toddler. It is taking its first steps, falls just like a toddler would, and then tries again and again until it can take its first baby steps. Like a child's brain, reinforcement technology invokes the trial and error process, CNBC News reports. As usual, all this has been tested by the military first, before it is released to the public. This is no exception to the rule because DARPA is evidently involved. The bottom line is that scientists know exactly how the human brain works by now, and when they introduce new technology to the public, they li literally do it in baby steps. They try to make us think as in the development of a human being, i.e., they first introduce robots that can manifest human baby behavior 
and then they go up the ages until they have fully functional adult robots walking amongst us, looking just as human as you and I. A good example of this is in an article that Popular Science published in December 2015. Robots could learn the same way babies do. The article ends with the following, quote, In the gaze scenario, a simulated robot is taught the mechanics of how its head moves and watches a human move its head. The robot then uses its new knowledge to move its head too, so it's looking in the same direction as the human. In another test, the robot is taught about blindfolds and how they make it impossible to see. With that newfound knowledge, the robot decides to not look in the direction where a blindfolded human is gazing. In the imitation experiment, the robot would watch a human pick something up from a table and understanding what the goal was, would either mimic the human exactly or find an easier way to pick up the object. These two different experiments are basic, but the team plans to find a way to teach robots about more complicated tasks as well. Babies learn through their own play and by watching others, says Andrew Meltzoff, psychological, psycholo sorry, psychology professor and collaborator on this research in the press release. They are the best learners on the planet. Why not design robots that learn as effortlessly as a child? Well, the dystopian pessimists out there might have a few reasons, but until then, baby robots sound pretty darn cute. Unquote. Yes, so long as they are cute. The learning curve of a new type of robot, allegedly developed by a different team, has already improved significantly. For an infant to go from sucking the mother's nipple and sleeping to be able to pick up things from the floor takes about four, four months. But this new robot goes from zero to grasping and picking up pieces out of the jumble in eight hours with 90% certainty, and it's all self-taught. This robot is developed by Fanus Corporation, a Japanese company, Japan being one of the forerunners in AI. This robot can, in a rational way, pick up certain pieces out of the jumble with 90% certainty within eight hours from when it was activated. This is still Stone Age in comparison to how far the AI research has actually come, but just as the controllers, I want to expose all of this on a gradient scale to show you the fast pace in which new technology is released on the market. You can almost feel the impatience of those behind the scenes, who can't wait to release the next generation of technology, and after that the next, and the next, and the next. Almost all of what we have discussed thus far happened in 2015-16. However, before this book is finished, you will notice that by then we will be far ahead of what we have discussed up to this point. The beginning of this book and the end of it might seem centuries apart in terms of describing technological development, but it's not. As I mentioned, most of it happened over a one to a one and a half year period. In order to get the picture of how much AI is part of humanity's future, we need to look at how much different corporations invest in this kind of research. Bloomberg.com writes, quote, Fanuc earlier this year paid 900 million yen, or $7.5 million, for a 6% stake in Preferred Network after rival ABB Limited invested several million dollars into AI startup Vicarious. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, Amazon.com Inc.'s Jeff Bezos, and actor Ashton Kutcher and Samsung are also among Vicarious's shareholders. Unquote. If you notice, an actor <clears throat> who portrayed Steve Jobs in a movie is thrown into the pot as well. Some Hollywood actors understand what the future will bring and where the money they've earned should be invested. And then uh, that's the end of that section and with a picture of actor Ashton. Dude, where is my car? 
Kucher. I don't know how you say his name. I mean, I've heard of his name <laughs> every now and then, but I don't know these people. Um, but anyway, illustrating that he is an, a big time investor in the AI. Okay, so we're going to end there with that section. We'll have pick up again in this chapter. Um, and if you stood, if you hung in there with me through this one, struggling through some of this reading in, um, on this video, it's I appreciate it because uh, it's the longer it goes, the harder it is for me to for me to read it. But, um, but next time we'll start off with the section robots with five senses on the rise, and um, and this chapter does stay pretty interesting from the, especially from this point on. So, um, so we'll talk to you then. Take care.